أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف بريته حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين Alhamdulillah, over these nights we've uh, covered a lot. Um, we reached the point where we now know the conditions for love of Ahlul Bayt, if we want to get maximum benefits out of that love, what the conditions for that are, what that love has to lead to, the fact that if someone doesn't have those conditions, that love still will help them, inshallah, um, and will motivate them to do more. We also talked about how to be able to reach that point where we we are an example of what these imams wanted of us these imams that we love so much what they wanted of us we have to plan we can't just expect to just be like that overnight no we had long lists of things that the imams had said I shared those lists with you were, they were in two hadiths where the imam shares with us what he wants of his shia to the point that he says I can barely call you a shia if you don't have these some people might get worried and say that's too much for us talked about how yeah you have to plan for it so then inshallah if you're in your 30s 40s 50s at least then we've accomplished them that takes practice that takes a lot of planning inshallah now all this talk of how actions are important how the love itself won't do everything to the extent that we had hadith that told us that if you don't take care of what you need to take care of the imams are afraid of our barzakh for us they will still, inshallah, according to those hadiths we covered, they will take care of our akhirah and they will do shafa'ah. But someone's got to do the work. If we don't do the work in this dunya, at least in the barzakh, we're going to go through some hardship. We don't want that. So a shia of Amir al Mu'minin is going to be such that they're going to try their best too, in addition to the love they have, try to fix this dunya through their actions so that they don't struggle in the barzakh. That's why we respect ourselves, we care for ourselves. And so we don't want our barzakh at least to be bad. All this talk of actions and all this talk of how love itself is not enough, at least for the barzakh, if not Yawm Al-Qiyamah as well, pushes some of us to do certain things when it comes to others. So what we want to talk about tonight is the famous life, the, the, famous, the famous line of God is the only one who can judge me. Let's talk about that a little bit tonight. You're hearing this sentence a lot these days. But before we get to that, a little introduction. When we, in this side of the world, we set up our centers and communities and so on, masjids, mosques, we, there's a purpose in all of that. And that is to bring the people in, educate the people, make sure they're on the right track so that they don't have to go through this idea of, oh, love is only going to do the work for me. No, they actually turn into good people. Out of all the people that attend our communities, mosques, centers, and all of that, there's a special focus on the younger generation as well, uh, as you all know. And that is the goal of a lot of places. I say a lot because some places you just get the feeling that, no, they just want to continue doing their traditional programs, which is fine. But other places you notice that, yeah, there is a focus on getting the youth engaged, getting the youth more active, and so on. But sometimes... There are certain things that happen in these centers that will defeat that purpose. In these communities, certain things will pop up and take place that will sometimes defeat the purpose of what we were after, which was to bring people in. And Imam Hussain, Muharram comes, he doesn't say, I want only the good people to come. When Muharram comes, it's like this net that he throws out as if. When you throw a net into the sea, it brings in everything. No, indiscriminately brings in everything. You'll have dolphins stuck in there, turtles stuck in there, there fish and sharks and all these things stuck in there. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, it's like when Muharram comes there, he throws a net, brings in all types of people. If that's how their approach is, the Imams, then if we are doing anything other than that, sometimes it might be defeating the purpose. We have to be careful. Why would something like that happen? Well, different reasons, but what we want to talk about tonight is what is what has led to, in my opinion, sometimes at least, what has led to this line being said more and more these days that only God can judge me. What's going on? All this emphasis on action, all this emphasis on doing things the way Ahlul Bayt want us to do has pushed some people 
to reach a point where in addition to caring for themselves they also care about others too yeah and sometimes this love hurts sometimes this love that people have for others to make sure others are also practicing the way that they're practicing it backfires what happens is and lots of times it's an older individual which would, might have a certain approach or a certain way of saying things to a younger person this person is turned off now is that okay is that not okay is it justified that this younger person is turned off is it not justified that's another story but it's a reality that we're dealing with today that that people younger people sometimes get turned off and what is hap what happens is youth come up to you come up to me and they'll talk to you about how yeah the only thing that stopped me from coming was the way this person or that person dealt with me in the in the center in the community and so on and so forth and when as i speak i'm speaking in general i don't live here right i'm speaking in general you notice this some center centers some communities will struggle more with this some will struggle less with it yes so we want to make sure that we get these things right as well as the younger people are growing up to not have so that we inshallah in the future don't have these issues too much yeah you speak to a lot of people and they let you know things that they f go through in an, in the environment that they're in in the environment of a community or a center that they're in they'll tell you talk to you about how judgmental people can be and so on and so forth this stems from the idea that i want others to also be good is there something wrong with that no there's nothing wrong with that but there's a way for everything it reaches a point though sometimes and i have to say this you get the feeling that some people they will call you out if you're doing something wrong in front of others sometimes even and it hurts that person's feelings but that doesn't matter why does a person do this sometimes you get the feeling that this person by doing such is taking themselves higher you see if we haven't fixed things up here our perspective hasn't been fixed we will f sometimes reach a point where to feel like I've gotten closer to Allah what will I do? I'll make sure others are thrown down I kick everyone, push everyone down there's two ways of being higher than the rest, right? there's two ways one is, like, let's say there's a, you and there's a ladder you're on and there's a ladder next to you and another ladder next, next to you two people on those ladders too three ladders, three people hmm? there's two ways you can be higher than the ones that are next to you on either side one way is to push their ladders down so they fall. Now I'm higher than them. <laughs> yes? Sometimes, no, you actually climb the ladder yourself and now you're higher than the rest. You get this feeling, brothers and sisters, sometimes. Some people will push it so far, more than is necessary, and sometimes even cross certain red lines of Islam when it comes to not hurting other people's feelings. You get the feeling that they're doing this because that's their way of being better than the rest not that they're trying to show off even but they have this feeling in their mind it's been something that's been instilled over the years in them that if I'm going to be the highest the only way I can be the highest is others if others are lower than me and to make sure of that I'm going to always be the one who's telling others things sometimes you get this feeling Baba if you want to go high if you want to be higher than the rest first of all you shouldn't be caring about the rest second of all if you want to be higher than the rest elevate yourself it's all about perspective, I said. Elevate yourself with more work, religious work, ibadah, things like that, rather than make sure others are always in the wrong. You sometimes get this feeling. But this is not something that's applicable to everybody, and I'm not trying to generalize here either. That's one thing to keep in mind now. I want to get into some details about this. Because someone might say, well, we have a concept in Islam called Amr al-Ma'roof. We want to talk about these a little bit, brothers and sisters. We have a concept in Islam called Irshadul Jahil to teach the one who does not know something. We have these things in Islam. Both are wajib in Islam. Amr al-Ma'roof nahi an al-Munkar is wajib. Irshadul Jahil is wajib. They're both wajib. So someone might turn around and say, you are saying that we are turning people off or causing problems maybe when we are you know, telling others what to do, what not to do. But these are, these are uh, tenets of the faith that we have to do these things. But brothers and sisters, we have to go to the conditions here. You see, 
Islam and all faiths, if practiced properly, they have the solution to a lot of issues. But if not practiced properly, can cause major damage. It's very simple. We have this in everything. In everything, this this applies to everything, really. Yeah, you go to the doctor. You have to get an injection. You have to have some pills. They give you the wrong pills. What happens? You all of a sudden you're in big trouble. Yeah, we always hear about those stories, some malpractice or something. Everything was go was supposed to go good. Just one thing was mistaken for the other. Everything goes wrong. It's not like oh he didn't get better, she didn't get better. They got worse, if not died as a result. These people who hate on religion, hate on organized religion and faith sometimes, yeah, they will point out certain things, certain mishaps that religion might have been the source of or the reason for, but in reality it wasn't that religion was the problem there. What was the problem? Malpractice of that religion. Yeah, not doing the religion, don't, not practicing it the way it was supposed to. And the reason for that sometimes is because we think the harder the act, that is the most important, that is the better it is in God's eyes. No, there are conditions for everything. If not met, there is no duty. And I'll talk about this later as well, that sometimes it's detrimental even if you are going to go ahead and do that thing. Let's start with Al-Amr al-Ma'roof wa nahi an al-Munkar. Recite a salawat please. There are certain cases where it doesn't matter if the person's going to get upset or not. You have a duty to do. Okay? One of them is Amal Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. It has to happen. But there are conditions to this wadifa and duty. If those conditions are not met, it's not wajib on a person. It might not even be recommended for that person to say anything in that, in that given situation. Yes? What are one of those conditions? One of the conditions is that there has to be a chance that it's going to have an effect on this person. Number one. Me telling that person is going to have an effect. There's a chance that it's going to have an effect. Sometimes you know for sure it's not going to have an effect. One. And two, it's going to turn that person off. Well, maybe it's better to wait a little bit until they're more ready to hear it. You are 100% sure it's not going to have an effect. You don't find in the deen anywhere that it might be recommended now to do something, to say something. Now each situation is different. Sometimes you know it's not going to have an effect, but you know if you say something, then someone else later might say something, someone else might later might say something. All together these will have an effect. That's one situation where it might be recommended to say something, yeah. Although you know what you're saying is not going to have an effect. But sometimes you know that it's not going to have an effect no matter what. Sometimes the situation will be such that it might be better not to say anything in those in that moment but more importantly and this is the part I want to talk about a little bit is that there's another condition too for Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al munkar what is that other condition? the other condition is that you have to be 100% sure this person who's doing this bad act or this whatever it is that I'll give some examples for sometimes it's not even a bad act but it's a condition of salat for example Okay, things like that. We'll talk about it. You have to be sure that this person is knowingly, willingly, voluntarily doing that thing, knowing that it's haram. Or else, al ma'roof is not even wajib anymore. Someone might say, right now, look at him. He's trying to like make things easier. No, it's more than that, brothers and sisters. It's not about making things easier or harder. It's about understanding that Islam is a package. That Islam sometimes wants to make things easier so that people can go hard when they're supposed to and then go easy when, they don't, when, when things aren't that important. Ayatollah Bahjat, one of our teachers who was his student, he told us once, he said, Ayatollah Bahjat says, certain ihtiyatat and precautions are against ihtiyat. You know what that means? That means sometimes you, you take precaution to be on the safe side, right? Sometimes taking precaution ruins your, 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 your faith in the future. It wasn't something that was necessary, but you did it anyway, which is fine. But sometimes it can reach a point where it's detrimental to your faith. Before you know it, you are spending time and energy and brain power on things that are not a priority. Then you won't have the energy that you need, the focus that you need for those things that are a priority, that are actual harams. 
Sometimes you're good to go. You are the type who will do ihtiyat throughout your life and there's no problem. But the ones who are under you, your family, your friends, are affected. So don't, don't anybody think that, oh look, we're just trying to make things easier and easier for us. No, we're trying to make things more real for us so that when there are things that we have to be careful about, we are careful about. Huh? Sometimes my friends tell me, oh, you made this easy for us, you made that easy for us. I'm like, just wait. Later on they ask me another question, I tell them this is the ruling. They're like, whoa, that's so hard. I'm like, yeah, those were easy, so that this hard one you actually do, because this is wajib. Okay? So this al-ma'roof, the other condition is, the second condition is, that you have to be 100% sure that this person knows the rule, and is purposely not doing, not living up to their wazifa and that wajib act. You have to be sure about that. Then Mawlana, that's like 80% of cases we're not sure about that. Then it's not wajib. I'm not trying to undermine this, this, act, of, uh, this act of Islam. No. But just, we're just explaining what the rules are here. Lots of times, brothers and sisters, someone might be doing something wrong and there's a chance that they're not paying attention to it. I don't know. I don't know. Let's say that this glass of water was najis and I'm drinking from it. People who see this, they probably, they're like, he probably doesn't know or else he knows the rules. The application of those rules, he's not doing it right. He doesn't know that this najis in there. Hmm? Here, if you want to tell them, it's not amr al-ma'roof. You can go ahead and tell them anyway, but it's not amr al-ma'roof. We have to understand this. Is it recommended for me to tell them? Not always. Sometimes it might even be makruh. Sometimes it might even be more than makruh to tell them. If, you feel, if, if a person is praying, for example, okay, when we do sajda, the shia, what are we supposed to do with, our, with the big toes? Put the tip of the big toes down in sajda when we go to sajda, right? I see a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, when they go to sajda, they, they're not putting the tip of their toes down. Does Amr al Ma'roof tell me I have to tell them now? Huh? Does it tell me to tell them now? No. Why? Because there's a good chance this person knows what the ruling is. They're just not paying attention maybe. But if I don't tell him his salat is batil, don't worry about that. Islam has said his salat is valid. <laughs> Who says I have a responsibility to make sure everyone's salat is done properly? First of all. Second of all, out of so many cases that the salat is not done properly, they're still accepted because the person missed a ghayr rukun part of salat. A non-pillar part of salat. If you miss a non-pillar part of salat, unintentionally, it doesn't break the salat anyway. Let's say a person even missed a pillar of the salat. Still, do I have to tell them? Islam says, no, it's not wajib. But they missed a salat because of this. But they don't know, brothers and sisters. They're not aware of that. Do I have to make them aware of that? We don't have maraja who say that. Are they trying? But this person on the day of judgment is going to have one less salat that they were supposed to have. That is not the case. Who said that? They did what they were doing and going by according to their yaqeen. It's between them and Allah and it's going to count still. What are, we, what, what are we trying to do here? Make sure everyone does everything by the books. We don't have anywhere where it will say that this is amr bil ma'roof. Because there's a chance that this person, yes, if I'm sure, someone knows the rule. This person knows that, I don't know, this type of music is haram, for example. And they're still listening to it on purpose? Yes. Amr al-Ma'roof comes in here. Is there a chance that me telling them is going to have them stop? Yes, it does. I have to tell them. So this is where the conditions are, an example for that. A person's clothing is najis. A person's clothing is najis. The back of his shirt, it has blood on it. He's praying. Oh, brother, brother. You don't, uh, your, your, your shirt is bloody. Brothers and sisters, nowhere will you find Marajit saying that you have to tell them. Why? Because he probably doesn't know. You're sure he doesn't know or she doesn't know. Their salat will be valid. Don't worry about it. It even reaches a point. Now, I know I'm get, probably getting myself in trouble a little bit because people don't know these rulings and they'll probably be shocked at what he's saying. But these are things that we all sit around in circles in Qum and we just like laugh about really sometimes. That, wow, the people really don't know this. We need to tell them. Not making it so hard on people. That WhatsApp message that comes that says, Hey people, tonight there's going to be a what? 
what do they call it? An eclipse. A lunar eclipse. Make sure you pray on that time. You don't have to tell the world. You know, you pray. But they're going to miss the salat. Don't worry, Allah will make it up for them. Because they were acting up, acting according to their wadifah and their duty. They were not aware of it. If it's a full eclipse and they find out about later, they have to do qada and make it up. If they find out later and it wasn't a full one, it was a half one, there's no wadifa. These things have all been determined in Islam. But what do I do? I put on my cape. You guys have heard me say this before, right? Put on my cape and I fly in the sky. What is it? What is it? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No. It's super religious man. Coming down to save us. There are a lot of these things that are not necessary to even say to people. Now someone might say, but isn't it good to be on the safe side? We go back to what Ayatollah Bahjad said. Sometimes going too much takes away more from you. It comes at a cost and a price. That's number one. Now, can't I assume that this person is doing haram so that, and purposely so that I can do amr ma'roof and inshallah get closer to Allah because I sat someone down in their spot. There was a chance that he or she, between them and God, honestly felt that this is not an example of or an instance of haram music. Let's just say, I don't want to sound like I encourage it. I have issues with music myself. Even the halal types, if it's too much, it can get addictive. I tell the batcha, there's a saying by him, it says it, it hurts your willpower. So it's not something encouraged, that's definitely, I would say. But this person, there's a chance that they feel that this is not this doesn't fall under the haram category because if you know the definition for haram music is one that's subjective a little bit there is some gray area can i not assume that this person is listening to haram music and purposely listening to haram music answer answer is what this is haram on you to assume that they're doing haram why cuz husn al dhan huh is wajib or su'adhan is haram itself to assume when there's a chance that someone, what they're doing is not out of their own their audacity that this is haram and I'm doing it anyway. There's a chance that they're just not aware of it. That this is an example of that. Misidentifying the application of the rule with this instance. In these cases, you cannot assume that it's haram even. So that kind of narrows down a little bit sometimes the scope of Amr al-Ma'roof. Yes? Oh, look at him. He's making things halal again. It wasn't wajib or haram to begin with, brothers and sisters. If there are conditions to a certain ruling, that ruling is not effective, does not, is not activated in your, regarding to you, if the conditions aren't met. Another thing now we have to talk about. Sometimes... This person, I know they're doing this action not because they want to go against God's word. This person is jahil of the ruling itself. It's not about the application of the ruling. Identifying whether this is najis or not, whether the back of their clothing has blood on it, things like that. And if you have any questions about this, please approach me after our majlis, or either whenever you see me today or tomorrow, so we can discuss this further, because I know there might be some questions in people's minds. Sometimes it's not about application and identification of the ruling and the examples for that ruling. Sometimes you know that this person doesn't know the ruling to begin with. Let's say for example, someone has just now uh, embraced Islam. They're 35 years old, they've embraced Islam. Yeah, This lady says, oh I love this, uh, this message of Islam, this Quran, I love it, it's so awesome, I want to be Muslim. How do you become Muslim? So you message them, this is, you, know, you just believe in God and the Prophet and you're good to go. And she's like, okay, alhamdulillah, tomorrow you see her walking around without uh, the proper Islamic attire. Now, if it's the time to tell her this, sometimes it's better to wait a little bit. Don't just burden people with everything altogether. They might just run away from the faith again. We have hadith for this too. But anyway, you know that if she was told that, hey, there's this concept in Islam called hijab, for example, okay, that she'll even appreciate it and thank you for telling her that. She's walking around without hijab. She doesn't know hijab is wajib. Is it wajib for me to tell her now? It's not going to be Amr al-Ma'roof anywhere. Why? Amr al-Ma'roof said, willingly, knowingly. She doesn't even know. So Amr al-Ma'roof is not applicable here, but something else is. And that is Irshad al-Jahil. A person who doesn't know the ruling, it is wajib on us to teach him that, that ruling. They say, 
Okay? So we have two reasons why it would be wajib for us to tell somebody to do something. But once again, is irshadul jahil always wajib or are there conditions? Once again, if you know that this person doesn't know the ruling, then it is necessary for you to tell them. Or else if there's a chance, once again, that no, it's not about that. This person just is, is, is just forgot that this, is, this rule is applicable to them now. There's nothing. This person yesterday was teaching me the ruling. <laughs> Think about it. Yesterday he was teaching me that when I do this, go to sajda, the tips of my toes have to be on the ground. But today I see, I noticed that their feet are, the whole foot is on the ground. Huh? So for sure they're not jahil. Yeah, then they're not paying attention to it. If they're not paying attention, Amr al-Ma'roof doesn't come in. Irshad al-Jahil doesn't come in to the whole picture. And if you ask me, about 70, 80, 90% of the time, brothers and sisters, there the cases out there where someone's not doing things the way they're supposed to be doing when it comes to the salah or something like that, or the person is about to break their fast because it's in the middle of Ramadan, but they forget, and then I stop them, don't eat. If anyone does that to me, I'm going to have a fight with them, by the way. <laughs> if I'm accidentally, <laughs> on a hot day, drinking some water, right? If I see somebody in the month of Ramadan, Ramadan Ramadan drinking water. What am I supposed to say? Oh my God, stop, stop, be careful. No, it's not like they're drinking fire, it's water. And for them, it must be a, a case of, or at least there's a chance, a good chance that they weren't paying attention to this. Hmm? I was out once with my mom in Qum. We were out. It was very hot and she was doing mustahab uh, psalm and, and fasting. We were somewhere, we went somewhere. And uh, there was a water fountain, so she started drinking water. I just watched her. I said, yeah, you drink, mama. You drink that water. I'm not going to tell you anything. As a matter of fact, there's hadith that say this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? 80, 70, 80, 90% of the time, brothers and sisters, there is no wadifa to begin with for us to say anything to somebody. Why am I saying this, all of this? Am I trying to make things easier? I'm going to make things harder actually because those 20 or 10% of times that it is wajib, you have to make sure you tell the person. So for example, if someone says, I, you know what, I just, this fasting, I don't, I don't want to have it today. I'm going to go break my fast. You sit down with them, you tell them, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you do that. We need to talk about this. There, Amr al-Ma'roof, it becomes wajib. A person walks in and says, I don't know, <laughs> this happened to me once by the way. Someone calls me up like it was, a, it was, no, they didn't call me up. We were out on, we were in Mashhad actually. One of these guys who has now started to be, is practicing when it comes to Islam, he tells me, Shaykh, there's like five minutes left before Salat becomes Qada, right? <laughs> five minutes left before the sun comes up for Fajr Salah. I still remember. He's like, I don't know how to pray. <laughs> five minutes before, I was done with my Salah, I want to go sleep. Can you teach me how to pray five minutes? It's wajib for me right there to stay up. Because this is Irshad al-Jahil. Stay up and say, okay, Habibi, this is how you do Fatiha. This is how you do the Surah. This. He still wasn't getting it. I don't know if he got the, the prayer in there in time or not. Point being, sometimes you know, you have to do whatever you can to do the Amr al-Ma'ruf. You have to do whatever you can to do Irshad al-Jahil. He's coming to you. She's coming to you asking, teach me. It's wajib for you to teach them. But in a lot of cases, this isn't the case that we have to say anything. It reaches a point. It reaches a point where in our Sunday schools, for example, you see this here and there. Some of our Sunday school teachers will go so out of their way to make sure that these kids learn every single ruling of Islam. Yeah, The kid is learning how to do the kafan and all of that, the kid is like 12 years old. I'm going to tell you right now, in the hawza, you learn this stuff way later. There are people, lots of people out there that are taking care of this, but he might get stuck in the desert one time and his friend is going to die and he has to know how to bury him. First of all, that's not going to happen. <laughs> second of all, second of all, I forgot what I was going to say, the second of all. <laughs> First of all, it's not going to happen Second of all, in this day and age, it is so easy to figure things out later. As long as you tell the kid, hey kid, for two minutes in Sunday school, just tell them, look, when someone dies, there's three waters that you use to wash them. These waters, some of them are mixed with something else. And then there's three pieces of cloth that are used to shroud them. 
you scratch the surface for this kid and what happens later when they grow up they can look things up when they need it it's not like the past like 30 years ago in america where we had nothing we almost had nothing if i if i'm living in north carolina my dad has to you know go to the auction buy a calf and then slaughter it in the backyard so that we have halal meat it's not like that no more you go to halal restaurants all over the place. MashaAllah, the halal industry is big. It's booming. But it reaches a point where we are going to be teaching kind of like Bahth al-Kharij of Hawza Ilmiya of Qom to kids who are 12 years old. Why? We want to make sure they get it right. Well, where does it say that you have to teach every single thing? You teach the things that they need as they're growing up. That's what you teach them. You don't waste people's time. But this waswas, this obsession sometimes, this misunderstanding of the deen, to make sure everything that everything is done right completely by the book, even if it's not my it's not my responsibility to make sure of that, causes issues. It goes against ihtiyat. So all these nights we've been talking about how important actions are. Yes? Actions, actions, actions. Some people they go overboard. And they make, they, they want to make sure everybody's doing it right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensates. He makes up for those things that are missed by some people if they weren't paying attention. Don't worry about that. So what are we supposed to do in the end? We are supposed to know our rulings when it comes to these things and telling people what to do, what not to do, when is it wajib, when is it not wajib, and just act accordingly. Someone will say, but that's making things easy. Brothers and sisters, Islam is a package. Allah Bahjad says, ihtiyat goes against ihtiyat. You can really see this where? In the waswas of najasa and taha. Some people, God forbid, this is something that, will, that can destroy lives. You see it happening. The guy wants to divorce his wife. The wife wants to divorce the husband. Why? Because this person washes the house every day. God forbid. Islam here says, it, when you reach a point where you're seeing that you are paying attention more to certain ahkam, whether it's in salat, whether it's in ghusl, when it comes to ghusl and wudu, whether it's najasa, tahara, issues, all these types of things, Islam says... I want you to be normal. You don't have to be obsessive about it and OCD about it. This person will wash something 20 times and feel like it's not tahir yet. Islam says it's haram. Haram! For you to pay attention to your shak and doubt from now on. Whoa! But what if it really is najis? You see, Islam doesn't care about these things sometimes because the greater, uh, the greater picture is being compromised. This is just an example I'm giving you. Najasa and tahara are actual issues in Islam. Mas'alas, they call them. But the same najasa and tahara is to be treated as tahir everything when you have waswas and that waswasa. Why? Because Islam doesn't just focus on every specific. Islam steps back and looks at the bigger picture too. Islam understands that if this person goes a little too overboard in due time, the religion that they have is gone. And that's why the Imams, we have hadith where the Imam says, this person who listens to himself or herself, when they overdo things and they're OCD about things, they're not listening to Allah, they're listening to shaitan. Hmm? The bigger picture. Why is he telling us that the conditions of, I'm not saying you guys are saying this, probably people in the future who see the videos, I don't know. Why is he making things not wajib on us anymore? Because brothers and sisters, sometimes when we overdo these things, people are leaving. Leaving, they're not interested in coming. They, they don't want to get judged. They're, they feel like they're getting judged. Well, if it's not wajib for me to tell them, why not not tell them anything? If Islam, when it comes to Najasa and Tahara, says, hey, if you are abnormal now, it's haram for you to do, to do things the way you used to. That same Islam will say, hey, in a lot of cases, mind your own business. And you don't have to talk to people about it. But I'll tell you when those, what those cases are, and those are what we covered. The, the condition of al-ma'roof and the conditions, conditions of irshad al-jahil. Yeah? What happens is, because these conditions sometimes are not lived up to, and we go overboard, you know what happens? You hear this line now. I want to talk about this line a little bit tonight. This line of only God can judge me. What happens? What happens is the person in a case where, in a case where Amr al-Ma'ruf was actually wajib, and you told them, "Hey, brother, sister, 
I think you should stop doing this. You knew that they're willingly, voluntarily, purposely doing haram. You go up to them, you say, brother, sister, um, I think you should stop doing this. I think you should stop making fun of this brother and sister. You're hurting their feelings. I think you should, you're, you, this, this type of provocative clothing for you, brother or sister, is wrong. You know what they'll say? Only God can judge me. Why? Because they've heard a lot of things before. This is also not always the case, but I'm just giving examples. Sometimes they've heard so much when it wasn't necessary that they become insensitive. And numb to those cases where you actually do have to tell them and they have to take you. Recite a salawat, please. So this line of only God can judge me, it's a very precisely, the, the wording here is very precisely chosen, by the way. Only God can judge me. Let's talk about that a little bit. This line can have several meanings. Okay? Which, one of the, which, ones of the, which ones of these meanings are actually true and accurate? And it is true that God can only be the judge. And in what cases is it false? And when someone's doing amal ma'roof to somebody, right, and they hear this line of only God can judge me, mind your own business, hmm? which ones of them are false? Which meanings of this are false? Let's see. I have I thought about five or six things here. Number one, when this person says only God can judge me, what they mean might mean is judge the act, whether it was a good act or not. Yes? This act that I did, only God can say if it's a good thing or a bad thing that I'm doing. Well, brothers and sisters, this is false. Why? Because Allah has also taught us what the good and bad are. According to Islam, of course, if we accept Islam. So if I tell somebody, hey, brother, sister, this is what you're doing is wrong, and they say God can only judge me, meaning only God can tell me what I'm doing is wrong, well, God has taught all of us what is wajib and haram, one. And two has said, if someone else is doing the bad, you can tell them and you should tell them if, there, if there's a chance it'll have an effect that what they're doing is wrong. Yes, Amr bil Ma'roof carries with it what? Carries with it a little bit of judgment. It's true. Me judging, coming to the conclusion that what they're doing is wrong. But remember, brothers and sisters, once again, Judging 100%, if I haven't reached 100% and there's a chance that they're not paying attention to something and they're, when they're doing it, that's another story. It's so funny. Like, I was in, the, one of the, I was in a, a supermarket once and I was, I was like, oh, look at that, these vegetarian sausages, you know, the ones that are, made, that are not made from meat, right? So I'm in a haram, a place that sells haram meat and stuff, normal, you know, normal supermarket. So I threw some of these in there, in the basket, and then there was a brother who had just moved from Pakistan or something, and I, met, I, and I ran into him in the supermarket. And so we're talking and stuff, and he looked down into my basket. And I don't think he ever paid, prayed behind me. <laughs> yeah? There's always a chance. You'll be surprised. So later on, actually, I spoke to him. I was like, hey, you know those sausages were vegetarian, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah, because you looked at me pretty strange. You looked down at the thing, you look... <laughs> Yes, there's a chance, but if, there, if I'm 100% sure, then yes, I can judge that action. God has told me that this, or Islam has told me, the Sharia has told me that this is a wrong act. If someone is purposely do, purposefully doing this, purposely, excuse me, doing this, number one. So that is true. I mean, that's, that's false. Excuse me, only God can judge me? No, 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 no. God has taught us the good and bad. Sometimes what is meant is, God can only judge whether or not we had ikhlas in an action or had a bad intention in an action. How dare you? You know, how dare you think that what I did was purposely done, willingly done. That's true. That is true. And that's why that husn al dhan and su al dhan comes into the picture, into the equation. That you, you have to give people benefit of the doubt if there's a chance what they're doing is right or wrong, they're not aware of it. So they're right over there. Only God can judge me. So that's why we have to be careful. Make sure the conditions are met before we tell this kid, hey, what you're doing is wrong. And then before you know it, this person never comes to our center again. Sometimes judge, only God can judge me means what? That only God, can, only God is the one who can punish me or not for this sin. That's true too. Yeah, it's none of my business. 
Sometimes they say, you got, only God can judge me means only God can say I'm an actual bad person because of the bad thing that I'm doing. That's right too. You see, so the, the, the odds are against us, brothers and sisters. <laughs> but what pushed this person to this point? Sometimes because when we weren't supposed to tell them anything, we did. We have hadith that will tell you that don't even say the bad person, the person is bad if they're doing a bad action. Say the person's the person, the action's a bad action. You see the wording that's even used. When I say Islam looks at things in a wholesome way, Islam is a package. It uses the right words even. It says, look, you want to tell them something? Make it about the action, not about the person. Are we careful about these things? The wording is so important in these things. They are so precisely chosen in the, in the sayings of Ahlul Bayt. One of our teachers said, you know why some of these people become waswasi regarding Najasa and Tahara? You know why that is? It's because the wording that you find when people are explaining these rulings is different than the wording you find in the hadiths. In the hadith, the guy comes to the, the, the imam, he says, I got some urine on me, what do I do? He says, wash it twice. Did he say make it tahir? No. Wash it twice. So you go home, you wash it twice. He didn't say make it tahir or not. Of course, we all know it becomes tahir as a result, but he didn't word it like that. Why? This is what our teacher was telling us once. Because, man, these teachers are awesome. They were saying, because if he had said make it tahir by washing it twice, he might wash it twice and feel like what? Maybe it's still not tahir. Let me do three times, four times. Before you know it, this guy has developed that OCD. And every time they want to wash something, something 12 times, they have to wash it before they are convinced that it's tahir. You get what I'm saying? The wording is very important. Here it says, here it says that, to say that act is bad. Don't say the person is bad. But once again, we find that sometimes it's the opposite, how we deal with the people. I'm going to have to cut it a little bit short. There are two hadiths here that I want to share with you before we end. The number one, the hadith, I love this hadith. It's one of my most favorite hadiths, by the way. It says, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِهِ That a sign, a sign of a person having proper Islam. حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ حُسْنُ الْإِسْلَامِ It's different than just normal Islam. حُسْنُ الْإِسْلَامِ This guy got it right. Tarkuhu, the fact that they stay away from that which has nothing to do with them. Things sometimes don't have anything to do with us. And if we kind of butt in and not mind our own business there, we cause other damage. One. And two, when we don't mind our own business, we get caught up in other things that we don't need to get caught up in. The second hadith is also going to be very applicable to, that, to us. The opposite of this hadith. That says, Tuba liman shagalathu ayubuhu an that man, good for the person who his or her own flaws is going to have them preoccupied to the extent that they are careless about other people's flaws. Going and figuring out, hey, let me see what's wrong with this person to make sure I fix that for them. Oh, fix, you, fix yourself. I'm already fixed. Okay, you can always elevate higher too. Spending time on other people. Yes, if you come across a case where you have to say something, you say something. Having said all of this, brothers and sisters, Right? These are the rulings. Yes, every situation is different. Sometimes it is not wajib for you to say anything. But other things, other factors will push you in the direction of still saying something. Okay, so there's always exceptions to the things that we talked about tonight. But that was the general rule. I'll just give you one example before I end of a place where it's not wajib to say anything per se. But another reason will come into the picture that will kind of push you in the direction of saying something. So I want to also say, I don't want to dismiss the other side completely. All I want to say is let's learn what we have to do, do it right, and then specific circumstances will sometimes dictate that we say something even if we don't have to from a shari'i perspective. An example for that would be, for example, a sister is walking in the street or walking in the center, very respected muhajjabi, right? She always covers up. Now she's not paying attention but the back of her hair is showing. Hmm? This is, is she doing it purposefully? No. So it's not, Amr al-Ma'ruf is not applicable. Is she jahil of the ruling and ignorant of what the law is? No, she knows the law too. So is it wajib for me to tell her? It's not wajib. But if she walks around in the center and people see, it's going to hurt her reputation, right? So from that perspective, you might have to. Sometimes certain circumstances will make it 
necessary and wajib for you. For like in this case, it might be wajib for you to tell her because it's hurting her image. In some specific cases, it might be recommended to say it. In a lot of cases, there's no recommendation even. This is the beauty of our religion. Our religion is beautiful. Our religion is easygoing. The Prophet said this in his hadith. But sometimes when we misidentify, misunderstand, don't learn, we can sometimes hurt ourselves and not know why we've hurt ourselves. Inshallah, Allah gives us that tawfiq to learn the religion properly and to apply it properly, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. <coughs> Sallallahu alayka ya Aba. <coughs> Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he has a soft spot. And all the Ahlul Bayt have this spot, have a soft spot. For the orphans. <coughs> Excuse me. For the orphans. And so, Imam Hussein has orphans in his caravan as well. On the night of Ashura, yeah, on the night of the Ashir, Imam Hussein, we've all heard that story where he tells his companions that they can leave if they want to leave and how he will turn the candle off and anyone who wants to leave can leave. And so, we've all heard the story how the companions reacted to that. And after they proved themselves and their worth to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein showed them where they're going to be in Jannah and he told them about the future of where they're going to be and end up. So as these companions, one by one, they announce and pronounce their loyalty to Imam Hussein, and they're content with what is coming the next day and they sit, they're happy. That is one more day in this dunya and we leave in the best of states. Then they say a child stands up. Qasim ibn al-Hasan. <clears throat> Qasim ibn al-Hasan, all his life has been an orphan. Because when he came to this dunya, when he was born, maybe one year later, one and a half years later, his father died out of the poison that was given to him. And so all his life, he's been longing probably to see his father one day. But who's been his father over these years? It's been Hussein ibn Ali now as if. And so, when he notices that tomorrow is the day that everyone is gone, not just Hussein is gone, the companions are gone, Ali and Al-Akbar is going to be gone, Abbas is going to be gone, everyone is gone. Is there a reason for him to stay, brothers and sisters? There's no reason for him to stay. And so they say he stood up and he asked his uncle, what about me? You told everybody else that they're going to leave this dunya in the best of states. What about me? And his uncle says, well, it depends. How do you see death, Qasim? He says, Ahla min al-asal. Sweeter than honey for me, O oh, Aba Abdullah. He says, you too will become shaheed. Some narrations say that he said to him, that you will, you will become shaheed after you go through a big hardship. So from that moment, you can tell Imam Hussein, probably in the back of his mind, he's worried now. Because there is an amana that he has, and he has to take care of, but now tomorrow, the time is going to eventually come where he has to give that up too. So as the companions went the next day, one after another, then the Bani Hashim went one after another, a time came when Qasim goes up to Abu Abdullah and he tells Abu Abdullah, can I go to the battlefield too? Defend you. Abu Abdullah doesn't give him permission. Abu Abdullah is getting tested, brothers and sisters. Every single test that befell Abu Abdullah was different than the other. Every single one, his brother, his beloved son, the six-month-old, Qasim ibn al-Hasan, everyone has a different tragedy. Qasim is different though. Qasim, you are a trust, you are an amana. So he comes to his uncle, he's begging his uncle now. They say he falls to his uncle's feet and is kissing his feet and hands. He says, I want to go, there's no point for me to stay. Abu Abdullah still doesn't give him permission until eventually he sees this kid is not going to give up. I promised him last night too and I have to let him go sometime. And so they say he embraces Qasim and he weeps and weeps with Qasim until both of them faint and pass out. Once they come back and they regain their consciousness, Abu Abdullah has to prepare this child for the battlefield. A little child, a child that's not even baligh yet. The armor doesn't fit him. He can't carry the heavy, heavy weaponry. 
And so they say, this kid, instead of wearing armor, they put on him a white cloth, a white, maybe you can call that a kafan. And they say when he mounted the horse, one of his shoes was untied. He's so desperate to go, he forgot to tie one of his shoelaces even, they say. He just wants to go, go to the battlefield. What is going through the heart of Abu Abdullah? He's waiting. This is not like Ali and Al-Akbar. Let me let him go. And whatever happens, happens. He's the first that has to go of Bani Hashim. This is Qasim. Abu Abdullah is waiting every second just to hear Qasim's voice. Qasim goes to the battlefield. They say they come after him. He's a kid. They eventually strike him in his head and it opens up and the blood is everywhere. He falls face first onto the sands of Karbala. He calls out to his uncle. His uncle comes racing to him as Abu Abdullah comes to help Qasim. There's a scuffle. Abu Abdullah comes to strike somebody. He block, blocks it with his arm. His arm gets cut off. This fight goes on and on and on. But they're, they're not aware that there's a kid on the ground under the hooves of the horses. Qasim's body is getting kicked around left and right as they're fighting. Abu Abdullah eventually sets away the enemy and dismounts his horse next to the body of Qasim. This kafan is now full of blood. They say Qasim was in so much pain that he was digging his heels into the sands of Karbala. They say Abu Abdullah said to Qasim, it kills me that you call unto me and I can't do anything for you, O Qasim. They say Abu Abdullah eventually picks up the body of Qasim, hugging the body of Qasim, taking him back to the tents as his feet are dragging on the sands of Karbala. La adhak Allah sin ad-dahr in dahikat wa alu Muhammadin mazlumun qad quhiru ala la'natullah ala al-qawm al-zalimin wa sayalamu al-lazina zalamu أي منقلب ينقلب والعاقبة للمتقين وعجل اللهم في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان صلوات الله محمد وآله